Section 21 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Turner. The Empire of Business, Section 21. My Experience with Railway Rates and Rebates. This subject carries one back to his early days. It was in 1856 that my chief, Thomas A. Scott, superintendent of the Pittsburgh Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad, was made general superintendent with headquarters at Altoona. I was his secretary and telegraph operator in Pittsburgh, and he took me with him. The duties of the superintendent of the line then in its infancy, included the making of local freight rates. These I entered in the rate book and naturally grew to take a share in their making. Our great aim in those days was to develop local traffic. Of through traffic, little was expected, although President Thompson, the great railroad man of his day, had ventured to predict that a hundred carloads of through freight would in time pass Pittsburgh daily. This prophecy was often quoted to show the length to which that sanguine but far-sighted official could go. Now every day thousands pass through the city in each direction. Local traffic, that is, traffic originating and ending upon the line, was then depended upon to yield revenue. One enterprising man would write or call to say that he was thinking of opening a stone quarry on the line and shipping dressed stone to the towns and cities if he could get rates enabling him to do so. Because traffic paying much less than we might think fair was better than no traffic at all, we would hold out every inducement to pioneers with the result that the quarry was opened. Another was willing to make the experiment of cutting bark and shipping it to tanneries, intending later, however, to erect a tannery in the forest. Here was a tempting new enterprise, and rates were readily agreed upon. Another thought a peculiar quality of sand was suitable for glassmaking, and was willing to open the deposit and test it. He was promptly accorded a siding, which was usually necessary, and rates low enough to permit him to begin. The plot began to thicken when a second man came with a proposition to open another similar factory or quarry, which he could not do unless he received rates equal to those given to his predecessor, although his railway hall might be longer. If two factories were to be only a few miles apart, it was obvious that they had to receive the same rates. And so the question of special rates, starting very simply, soon became a complicated one. Areas had to be established in which the rates were uniform, although this involved the seeming injustice of charging more per ton per mile upon the traffic of one than of the other. This could not be avoided. At a later date, corporations were found desirous of establishing ironworks and of opening coal mines, etc. From such small beginnings was built up the enormous local traffic of the Pennsylvania Railroad, unequaled, it is believed, by any other line in the world. All these rates, it will be understood, referred to traffic within the state of Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh and Philadelphia being the terminals of the line. Beyond Philadelphia was the Camden and Amboy Railway. Beyond Pittsburgh, the Fort Wayne and Chicago, separate organizations with which we had nothing to do. During this period, through traffic occupied an entirely subordinate position. Rates for it were made in Philadelphia by a freight agent who then was an official of little importance compared with what he soon became. 
Upon the completion of the Erie, New York Central, Baltimore and Ohio, and the Pennsylvania systems between the Atlantic seaboard and the Great West, a strong competition for through traffic once began. At first it was a scramble, and each road got what it could at the best rate it could, regardless of everything. The position was peculiar and is so still, and must long remain so. Eastbound tonnage from Chicago, St. Louis, and other points in the west to the Atlantic seaboard is far greater than that from the east to the west. Hence, long trains of empty freight cars have to be hauled westward empty. It is evident why westward-bound freight was eagerly sought by all lines. Each had its freight agents all scrambling to secure the prize. What rates might be obtained for westbound freight was a secondary consideration, for any rate was clear gain. Since cars must go west in any case and might as well go loaded as empty. Hence, bitter wars broke out between the roads at intervals, and the four presidents would meet and make what was called a gentleman's agreement. These worthy presidents would give their word of honor that certain rates would be strictly adhered to, and gave orders to that effect, we may be sure, in good faith to their subordinates. But it is a remarkable fact, notwithstanding, that these gentlemen's agreements did not last long, but required renewal at short intervals. The rates agreed upon were too easily evaded. The assistant freight agent or one of his staff could promise certain favors to shippers upon other traffic, while adhering strictly to the agreed-upon charge for that he was securing or could remit charges upon other freight not involved in the agreement. So gentlemen's agreements were made and remade, but meanwhile, freight from Pittsburgh was often sent by way of the Ohio River, some 500 miles, to Cincinnati, transferred from boat to railroad car there, and transported back to Pittsburgh by rail passing through its streets to the seaboard for less than the fixed rate upon the same articles from Pittsburgh direct to the seaboard. It was the same with freight from the east to the west. Many a trainload of iron from the east has passed through the streets of Pittsburgh, paying less freight than was charged upon the same articles from Pittsburgh to the same points west. The Pennsylvania Railroad had a monopoly of the traffic, and much grievous wrong had we manufacturers in that state to suffer in consequence. We must not be understood as blaming the Pennsylvania officials severely. They did not raise our Pittsburgh rates, and these in themselves might be considered fair but they lowered the rates to our competitors in their warfare with the trunk lines. This bore hard upon the manufacturers of Pennsylvania, and especially of Pittsburgh. It would have been a wiser and broader policy if the Pennsylvania Railroad had been bold enough to say, Come what may, we will protect manufacturers upon our own lines but it required more than the ordinary railroad official of that day to reach this height. A perfect system of rates over the various routes could not be reached without first passing for a season through great irregularities and making many mistakes. Order had to be hammered out of chaos. These were the days when the much-talked-of rebates had their origin. Gentlemen's agreement rates were charged, and the bills of lading were fair and square on the surface, but the understanding with the shipper was that rebates would be allowed and settled for at some future time. The keener members soon discovered that evidence might be called for by competing lines, and the question asked, have any rebates been paid on this shipment? The party concerned might be able to say that he had paid none, 
but had he been questioned a month or two afterward, perhaps, or asked if advantages in other directions had not been granted to the shipper, he could not have so stated truthfully. In short, every conceivable way of keeping the word of promise to the ear and breaking it to the hope was indulged in. At least we shippers over the Pennsylvania Road heard from its officials from time to time that the other lines were most unscrupulous competitors and solely blamable for the reigning disorder. The sentiment aroused in Pittsburgh because of these unequal rates became dangerous. The Pennsylvania Railroad was regarded as a monopoly strangling to local interests, and so it was. The manufacturers of Pittsburgh, never in a position to get rebates, were in fact being driven to the wall by the competition of manufacturers upon other lines whose products passed their doors and were carried a thousand miles over the Pennsylvania system for less than they were compelled to pay for half the distance. Remonstrances were constantly made, but without avail, until the time came when the railway company had a dispute with its men, which gave occasion for an outburst of the smoldering bitterness Pittsburgh felt. Grave riots took place, and the spirit of hostility shown by all classes to the great monopoly brought from Philadelphia, my former chief, then vice president, to Pittsburgh. At a conference with the manufacturers, it was agreed by him that no matter what the through rates fell to, the local traffic on the lines from Pittsburgh would be carried to Chicago or Philadelphia and New York at a small difference less than the through rate between the seaboard and Chicago and other points. That is to say, Pittsburgh traffic would be charged only a shade less for half the distance than Philadelphia and Chicago through traffic paid for double the distance. Rates according to distance were denied. With this, the Pittsburgh manufacturers had to be content. Matters went along tolerably well until railway rates were again thoroughly demoralized by war between the trunk lines. Our Carnegie Steel Company, upon this occasion, had had what it thought the certainty of a contract of great value for material with the Newport News Shipbuilding Company, freight from Pittsburgh to Newport News being much less than from Chicago. The contract, however, went to Chicago, and upon investigation, we found that the rate given to our Chicago competitor to Newport News was less than the Pennsylvania Railroad rate from Pittsburgh, the distance not one-half so great. President Ingalls of the Chesapeake and Ohio, then beginning his brilliant career, had made the lower rate for his new line not yet embraced in the Gentleman's Agreement. We investigated and found several rates of a similar nature prevailing to other points, and having a list of these made, the writer carried it to President Roberts of the Pennsylvania Railroad with a request that he place us upon his own line on an equality with manufacturers on other lines. When the paper was presented to him, showing the overcharges we labored under, he pushed it aside, saying, I have enough business of my own to attend to. Don't wish to have anything to do with yours, Andy. I said, All right, Mr. Roberts. When you wish to see me again, you will ask an interview. Good morning. The situation had become intolerable, and we looked about for the best means of protecting ourselves. A railroad line of our own, from Pittsburgh to the Lakes, would be an invaluable acquisition, rendering us independent of any monopoly and enabling us to transport all our ironstone traffic from the lakes to Pittsburgh and our coal and coke from Pittsburgh to the lakes, also giving us connection with the other through lines. 
I purchased the harbor at Conneaut and a few miles of railroad connected with it and began extending the line to Pittsburgh. My partners had good reason to dread the consequences of the reckless challenge to the monster monopoly, and I could not blame them, for it undoubtedly had the power to cripple our operations. An intimation to the superintendent that the car supply for our works or the movement of our traffic need not receive undue attention would be serious indeed. As a precaution, I took good care that the authorities in Philadelphia were advised of the policy I had determined to pursue if there was the slightest interruption to our business. All our works would be stopped. I would visit each in succession and inform the workmen why they were idle, publish the monopoly rates, explain why Pittsburgh needed our new railroad, and ask them and all the workmen from other mills to stand with folded arms upon the streets over which the Pennsylvania trains passed for miles, in peaceful protest and as an intimation that justice had better be done to Pittsburgh. No interference with our operations came. It was not long before I received a note from Vice President Thompson saying that President Roberts and himself would like an interview. I agreed to call as I passed through Philadelphia and did so. I write this in the first person because my partners did not see their way to fight the great Pennsylvania Railroad, but my Scotch blood was up and I was in to fight to the death, determined no longer to stand what we had been groaning under. It was indeed a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a railroad monopoly in those early days, and yet this is to be said for the railroad. While its rates for competitive traffic were being reduced beyond reason by competition, the company needed all the more the high rates upon local traffic if these could be enforced. This was no doubt taking a very narrow view but railroading was then in its infancy, and public sentiment was not the force it has since become. What I needed for the interview with my former railway associates were the secret rebate rates prevailing elsewhere. Our freight agent, Mr. McCaig, then a clever young man, obtained these and placed them in my hands in a few days. He had left me with the word of Richelieu ringing in his ears. From the hour I grasp that packet, think your guardian star rains fortune on you. Sometime after that, he was, of course, admitted to partnership. That was the turning point in his career. Entering President Roberts' room, I found him and my dear friend Frank Thompson, vice president, sitting together. My reception was cordial. How are you, Andy? How are you, Mr. Roberts? How are you, Frank? Gentlemen, you asked me for an interview, and here is the culprit before you. Put me in the dock and question me as you wish. Frank said, This is just what we want to do. May I be examiner? Yes, I said. You are just the man. What are you fighting the Pennsylvania Railroad for? he asked. You were brought up in its service. We were boys together. Well, Frank, I knew you would ask me that question, and here is the answer. I handed him the packet of secret rates and, begging to be excused for a few minutes, left the room, desirous of giving them an opportunity of looking it over together. Upon my return, they were still sitting with the packet lying before them. Frank raised his head and exclaimed, Andy, I feel like Rip Van Winkle. Frank, the Pennsylvania Railroad officials have slept just about as long. Well, tell us what you want. I don't want anything. I did not ask to see you. You asked to see me. Don't talk that way. What do you want? We wish to make an arrangement satisfactory to you. We did not know these things were going on. We can hardly believe it, but we shall now find out. Tell us what you think we ought to do. I said, gentlemen, all we have ever asked 
was that the rates charged us shall be at all times as low as those which competitors on other lines are paying on the same articles for similar distances. We ask for nothing else. Other lines are carrying freight for our competitors cheaper than you are carrying it for us, and you take part of this freight at the cut rates. We cannot stand that. We have never asked for lower rates than our competitors, but we shall never rest satisfied with less. If you will stop building that line from the lakes to your works, we will do what you ask, was his response. Gentlemen, that cannot be. I have agreed to build that line, and certain parties have taken action in consequence of my promise. It has to be built. Repeated efforts were made to induce me to forego building, until finally I said to President Roberts, You have just given a rival concern about to build works on your line in Pittsburgh, an agreement to give them everything you give us. We make no complaint. But if I had come to you and asked you, Mr. Roberts, to withdraw that agreement, and you had told me you were pledged to give it, I should say no more. I should expect you to keep your word. If abandoning the new line is a condition of anything you will do for us, we must part. No more was said upon that subject. Then came the extension of the lake line we had decided to build from Pittsburgh to our Coke ovens. They wished that stopped, and as I was not yet pledged to build it, I said that was a matter for negotiation. If they wished to carry our Coke over their line from the ovens to our works at Pittsburgh at the same rate agreed upon with the new proposed line for that service, they could have the contract. This they gladly accepted. The result of the meeting was that I got all I asked for and greatly obliged the Pennsylvania Railroad by allowing them to retain transportation of our own coke traffic from the coke fields to Pittsburgh. Everything was satisfactorily arranged, and we were all boys together again. I was the ally of the PRR, much to my delight. It was estimated that the agreement saved us about one and a half millions of dollars per year, a large sum upon our business then. Railway officials, free from restrictions, could make or unmake mining and manufacturing concerns in those days, and could do so still had we not at last a court of appeal and laws against obvious discriminations. The Interstate Commerce Commission is to become one of our greatest safeguards. I must not forget to mention that one part of the understanding was that so long as the Pennsylvania Railroad gave us the same rates our competitors paid for similar distances anywhere in the United States, we would not be parties to building any additional lines in the Pittsburgh district in competition with the Pennsylvania Railroad, and this agreement lasted until Mr. Cassatt returned to power. I was in Europe when he changed the coke and other rates, not knowing their origin or the details of our agreement with his predecessors. All that we asked and obtained, as I have explained, was the same rates given by other lines to our competitors, and nothing lower than these. It was impossible, I am told, for the railroad company to do anything, however, but charge the regular rates on some of our shipments as made, and at the end of each month to compare these rates with any they had given to others, or which we could show their competitors had given to others, for similar traffic. Therefore, the necessary deductions, if any, that had to be made to us might be considered in one sense technically rebates upon the higher rates charged, although not such in any true sense. For the net result to us was that, according to the agreement, we got just the rates that the Pennsylvania Railroad officials were satisfied our competitors were paying in other districts over other lines.
Thus, we were given, as it were, the most favored nation clause, nothing more. The new raid on Coke was in a different category. Here, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company elected to take the place of a threatened rival railroad and had to meet its terms. The Carnegie Steel Company only got what the new line was to give it. The efforts of Pittsburgh manufacturers to escape the thrall of the great monopoly were, first, the making of an independent line to the lakes and connecting with the New York and Erie, New York Central, etc., which was done, but subsequently sold to the Vanderbilt interests, who offered $3 for one invested. It proved to be a great mistake to sell because it permitted the two railroad systems to confer and come to terms upon fixed rates and probably division of traffic. Thus ended effort number one. Sometime after, when war again broke out between the rival systems, the late William H. Vanderbilt asked me what I thought of the project of his able and enterprising son-in-law, Mr. Twombly, to extend the reading system to Pittsburgh through Pennsylvania. I thought so well of it that I said, if you will undertake it, I and my friends will go with you to the extent of five million dollars, a prodigious sum then, at least to us. If you will, then I will put in five million dollars also, he replied. Thus the South Pennsylvania was organized and its construction begun. Here was a chance for the New York Central to grip and hold its antagonist by the throat, but the Pennsylvania interests, seeing what the movement involved, approached Mr. Vanderbilt while I was absent in Europe and induced him to surrender. Exactly what advantage the New York Central system received I do not know, but it should have been great indeed, for this was probably the greatest mistake in its history. Mr. Twombly had found the key to masterdom for the Vanderbilt interests, but it was foolishly thrown away. The work on the South Pennsylvania was stopped and our investment returned. Thus ended effort number two. My personal effort to build the Bessemer Railroad to the lakes came after these vain efforts of United Pittsburgh to emancipate herself. When Mr. Cassatt ended the agreement entered into between his predecessor and myself, I was quite prepared to take up the challenge. We were once more free. An idea struck me one morning. I called upon Mr. George Gould and said to him, Years ago, soon after I had taken up residence in New York, your father approached me in the Windsor Hotel and said he would buy the control of the Pennsylvania Railroad and divide profits equally with me if I would promise to devote myself to its management. It was a great compliment to be paid to one so young, but my heart was already in steel development, and I declined. This morning I come to you and offer an opportunity to create and control a through line from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Extend your line to Pittsburgh, and we will give you a contract for one-third of all our business, provided you agree to give us the rates prevailing elsewhere and enjoyed by our competitors. I offered to build west to meet him, and also to join him in building east. Fortunately, he agreed, and the result is that the Gould system today is in Pittsburgh enjoying that contract. We were just upon the eve of arranging to extend the line eastward, taking in our coke works and route, which would have been a hard blow to the Pennsylvania Railroad, since we controlled our own coke traffic, when Mr. Morgan asked Mr. Schwab if I wished to retire from business. If so, he thought he could let me out. I replied in the affirmative, having resolved early in life not to spend my old age struggling for more dollars. I had seen so many pitiable cases of men with fortunes to retire upon, but nothing to retire to. 
condemned to continue like flies held fast by the revolving wheel to whom change means misery. Of course, we stopped all negotiations looking to eastern extension after this, and the result was my retirement from business. With Mr. Cassatt's return to power as president of the Pennsylvania system came needed reform, and it gives me pleasure to record the great service that companion of my youth did to the railroad interests of the country. In doing so, he broke the Constitution of Pennsylvania, which prohibits any of its railroads from controlling competing lines by purchase or otherwise. He bought large interests in the Baltimore and Ohio and other competing lines. But when he did this, I do not believe he knew he was breaking the Constitution, for in those days railway officials thought little about the law because it rarely touched transportation operations. These investments have since been sold by the Pennsylvania Company. His influence upon competing lines became decisive. He enforced uniform rates honestly on the Pennsylvania system, and he gradually induced the other lines to adhere to them. Then was established what is called the, quote, community of interest, unquote, idea. In the interval, the government had taken up the subject of interstate commerce, which the states were and are clearly unable to control. Wise laws were passed and a national commission appointed, and the evils of rebates are today already unknown. Under present laws, no corporation can afford to offer, neither can any person or company afford to receive, rebates, the risk of exposure and punishment being now fortunately far too great. Thus the conditions described as prevailing in the past in railway transportation, then still in the formative stage, are rapidly being succeeded by a system finally to become as perfect as is possible for man to create and maintain. The President has performed a great service, focusing the attention of the country upon certain crying evils, and the present position of the government is all that could be desired. The dead past is to bury its past. It is rapidly doing so. It was the custom for different rates to prevail in the beginning of railroad development when all was chaos, but our conditions are soon to be those which the old lands have been led by experience to establish. We are only following their example in supervising railway and other corporations strictly, as we do national banks. Leases, mergers, purchases of shares, control of other lines or corporations, the issue of bonds and stocks, and the rates of freight must all be reported, examined, and approved by the tribunal which is to become our industrial Supreme Court. We may rest assured that the Interstate Commission, progressing from year to year as it gains experience, will sustain fair rates for the railroad companies and establish what is indispensable, equality of rates throughout the whole country. The equality of the shipper will soon become an axiom ranking with the equality of the citizen. One shipper's privilege over any railroad, every shipper's right. Different rates per ton or per mile may prevail in different sections or under different conditions, but these will be open to all. This will give to shareholders in corporations a degree of security hitherto unknown, enhance the value of their investments, and prove as beneficial for the corporations as for the shareholders and the country. Capital, both domestic and foreign, will be attracted more than ever to this field. The creation of the Commission is the most important addition that has been made in our day to the machinery of government. It should be proclaimed by the administration and leading statesmen of both parties and kept clearly before the people that no radical action has either been taken or is contemplated.
On the contrary, all that is desired is only what other nations already possess and is in the truest sense conservative and preservative in the highest degree. The ease and rapidity with which the commission was established, which has already abolished demoralizing rebates and is rapidly giving to corporate investments the security they possess in other lands by bringing them under supervision, is a great triumph for our governmental system in all departments, legislative, executive, and judicial, and gives to all the assurance that no emergency can arise in our country which will not be promptly and successfully met. An intelligent, just, and fair-minded people at the base, cordially approving the salutary measures of their representatives, with the President, a great reforming force at the head, leading the way. End of section 21. My experience with railway rates and rebates. End of the Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie.